Hello everyone. Sorry about that. We're having uh, some Facebook issues. Uh, this has been a common occurrence, so we're just trying to uh, get through this. Uh, if you're joining us now, welcome. <laughs> we are going to be going over static theatrical lighting equipment today. Um, if you may remember, I actually went over most of the equipment behind me in a previous video during our first educational uh, outreach series. But Today, we're going to take a little bit different of approach, and we're also going to cover some new units. I think we're all here again, so welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions or ha want to say hi or anything, feel free. I'll be able to see it right here. Let's get into it. Um, talking about what units I have behind me. I have our Encore Profile Pro Color, Encore Profile Pro Warm White, our Par Z100. Uh, our PAR-Z120 RGBW, our PAR-Z100 3K, our FR150Z, and over here to the corner is something that you haven't really seen before, is our FS3000 LED follow spot. So I'm going to kind of work it down that order down and get to that last. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'll be addressing them live. Awesome. So let's talk about the color. And before I turn anything on, let's just talk about the fixture itself. So this is obviously, like I said, the color version. It's a red, green, blue, white, amber, and lime LED. What that essentially means is that you have a very, they have a lot of different, different color LEDs inside the LED chip, and that will help you get a very broad spectrum. Uh, of, so basically, you can choose through a lot of different colors, a uh, very wide color spectrum, as you could say. Um, but another really cool thing about this is that it doesn't only just do colors. You can also, we all have also built in a dynamic white fader, and I'll show you guys that in just a second. So another thing to mention about the color is that it has a high CRI of 90 plus, depending on which, how you are running it. The, day, the dynamic white mode is where you actually do get the very high CRI. So when you're, kind of, when you're running in just red, that obviously doesn't have any play there. However, the individual chips are very deep and are very saturate. So if you want to do nice deep saturate colors, you can achieve that as well. Or you can do a dynamic white, white, color, white color corrected Kelvin temperature. And again, high CRI, very nice quality whites. However, this only emits around 5,000 lumens of output. And every and the lumen output depend, depends on what lens you are using. We are supplying, and we make 14, 19, 26, 36, and 50 degree lenses. So yeah, feel free to go online and check out the individual photometric reports for every single lens tube if you would like. Hello again, Mr. Ted. <laughs> so, let's talk about the body of the unit itself. Uh, I won't pull that one out, but this is a lens tube. So every different, every lens tube is made, you probably won't be able to see that, but it's okay. This says 26 on the side, so this is a 26 degree lens tube. And these will basically change the degree throw distance. Uh, for example, I actually have an Encore Profile Pro Color up in front of me for my front light here, and that's really nice because I can actually change the dynamic white scale for depending on who's presenting. For instance, uh, one of our other sales guys, Edgar Bernal, he has a very different skin tone than I do, so he needs a completely different Kelvin temperature than what I need. So uh, it's really easy just to be able to go into your console and change it right from the console as opposed to having to put a gel in. We won't get into that. So on top of that, in the 14 degree looks a little different because you can't actually do an accessory slot on it. But here we have an accessory slot up front. And these are all industry standards. So if you have current, um, stu current equipment that goes into accessory slot, for instance, gel scrollers, I don't know why you would want to do it on a color unit, but you can. So there you go. And uh, motorized mirrors, again, kind of old school, but you can do it. Uh, you have your gel frame here. Don't forget to put the closed towards the bottom so your gel doesn't fall out. And you might be asking, well, why would I want to put gel in a color source? 
Well, one of my favorite things to do in a color source with a gel is to actually put some frost in there. A light frost can frost it out. And you may say, oh, well, you can just run the barrel. That is true as well. Some designers like to put frost in the unit. Some like to run the focus in or out, just depending on what you want. We'll talk more about gel when we get to our warm white only option. The rest of the hardware wise, behind this you have a shutter assembly and that's pretty easy to understand. There's four different blades, top and bottom, left and right, and you actually push them in and that will do a nice shutter cut and cut off, kind of like what, how a barn door operates, except it's a little different because of where it's actually placed in the optical path of the light. This lens here will actually redirect and kind of change how it works. So if you're doing the left shutter, you'll actually tucking in the throw on the right side and we'll show you exactly how that works when we talk about the actual throw when we take a look on our other screen. Uh, keep on moving back on the top of the light. We have an accessory slot so you can put your gobo rotators, your motorized irises, your manual irises, anything that goes in that accessory slot in the shutter assembly. And behind that you have, well, behind that you have your gobo holder which is supplied from us and these are B-size standard gobos so if you have any current B-size gobos you can go ahead and put them in there or glass gobos whatever you want and that ships with us so very handy to have around uh, behind that is where we'll actually is kind of like where we take over and what products we made this is the whole LED engine behind that uh, and that includes the cooling, the PC boards, to run the menu, to run the whole unit, everything like that. Um, and we may do an under the hood of this unit in particular, depending on how much we actually, uh, depending on how, if you guys want to see that. Let us know in the comments if you want to see under the hood of the Encore profile. It's very basic, but maybe uh, awesome for you guys to see. Let me see if we have any comments here. Hello, Karen. Karen's actually our marketing coordinator in Mexico City, part of our uh, Mexico office. She does a lot of great work. Hello, Karen. Nice to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Candace says hello as well. Cooper. Hello, Cooper from Oregon. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, all right. That's pr oh, another thing I forgot to mention um, is in here and um, in our actual yoke, is we have incorporated our, our Sherlock locking tilt mechanism and you, it actually locks with rubber teeth in the tilt mechanism to every tenth degree. So that's really cool because you don't have to worry about losing or slipping focus. When you do get some extreme barrels like for instance 10 degree barrels or barrels that are very very long, you all know what I'm talking about if you've used standard ellipsoidals before with those narrow degree lenses is that they're really heavy and then on top of that if you throw or even just a regular lens with something heavy in the front of it, it gets really heavy and you have a chance to slip or lose your focus. With this, the rubber teeth will lock into every tenth degree and will not allow you to lose any focus. Let's see here. All right. Um, on the back, uh, we won't really go into it. There's a carrying handle and a really nice menu. Now let's look about what the light can actually do. Awesome, thank you Candace. So, right now let's talk about the colors individually themselves. So, one thing I'm going to do before we even start is actually turn on a dimming mode. Right now I'm going to go to a theatrical dimming mode and this is going to make my dimming very, very nice and smooth. So this is the red chip. And again, uh, go, doing this on camera may be a little uh, weird. Armin, hello. Hello, Armin. Kaden, how's it going, Kaden? Uh, so again, these may not look exactly how they look in real life, but that's just camera settings and so on and so on. But these are very nice, deep saturate. So this is the green. Throw in the blue chip. And this is from a 14-degree lens tube, which again, we supply and make the white chip and you'll notice this actually is more 
warm white LED of a warm white than, uh, than a regular white than you may see in our ParsiMove RGBW. And that's really just because we take into consideration how all the white blends in with each other. So for instance, you may say, oh, this is not very impressive at all. But it's not how this chip performs on its own. It's how it performs with all the other chips, the red, green, blue, white, amber, and lime. So and all those together, that makes a very nice, solid white light and a high, Kelvin, uh, and a high CRI score. So we'll move on. Here is our amber chip. And I love the amber chip. I, I think lights that have amber chip have just great color spectrums. And I personally am a very big fan. And this looks actually a little more warmer on camera than it does in person. But it's, uh, it's, it's a very, I don't know, I guess just with my history of being in the theatrical market and doing you know, tons of theater, I really like the warm amber glow that you get from an incandescent lamp. And this simulates it very well. And then finally, lime. And lime is very, very important because li the lime chip helps out, helps balancing, and helps us to get that very nice, crisp white. Very, very important right there. So now, let's go and talk about our Kelvin temperature. So I'm going to go through this really fast, then we'll stop and go back to it. So just going up from warm light all the way. Now we're at daylight, 4,500, 5K. And then we're going to go into the 7,000s, 8,000s. And now we're at 8,500 Kelvin. And for those that may not be familiar with a Kelvin scale, Kelvin is essentially the difference between a warm white and a cool white, and in the middle between regular daylight uh, wave, the, not the wavelengths, but basically the Kelvin temperature or how warm white or cool white the light is. Uh, you see these more in um, Fresnels and standard incandescent lamps, especially in the studio or film industry where people need a certain daylight locked in Kelvin temperature. These can do that. Now um, let's go to a, let's go to something that you can explain that next one. Let's go right here. So this is about uh, 3900, uh, 2900 Kelvin. So another really cool thing about this, as you can see, I can get nice warm white options, but you may not be able to tell on camera. But I can add. There is another. What's the word I'm looking for? There's another feature built in here, and it's called tint saturation or green shift. And right now I'm at normal, and I'm going to rock between higher green shift and lower green shift. And essentially what that will do is, well, if it isn't kind of evident, it will shift the green. And yes, Orrin, I agree, it is all, all about the amber. Amber is my favorite. Um, and th this is primarily what I found for more filming applications. You don't necessarily see these a lot in just standard theatrical, oh, I'm just looking at it from my eye. Um, but camera work really picks up the green on, the green really picks up on the camera. Not to mention, the green is really valuable. The green is really valuable for uh, different skin tones and balancing them, I've found as well. So there you go. There you have it. Now while you're looking at there, I will demonstrate the shutter, how it works. So right now I'm going to grab the left shutter, and I'm just going to push it in slightly. See how that's going on the right-hand side? So that's part of the optics in the actual unit. So this is how a shutter assembly works. I can go and I can change these to make exactly how I want. And I'm looking at this backwards right now, and I have not focused it's a ellipsoidally in it quite a while. So please forgive me. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Candice. So, I'm essentially just moving these shutters in and out to create a shape I would like. There's four shutters. So that's displaying that. And then right here on the top and or bottom is where I can shift my focus. Sorry if that's a little loud. Can you switch back to the screen? Yeah, perfect. So now you can see there's a happy medium in there, nice and sharp. And then if I run the focus in or out, it will soften the look. The look. And essentially, that's what I was talking about for light frost. But this is not going to be as frosted as you would if you were to throw an LSF filter in there. And that's really important. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before moving on to our next light is 
right here, you'll notice I have a, a, a knob on the top and the bottom. You can either choose to run one on the top and none on the bottom, or none on the bottom, one on the top. And essentially, the reason why we include two is, one, it locks it down a little easier. And secondly, these get lost a lot. And um, either the way I have had it explained to me is if you have these on your high sides and you're up in your scissor lift or you bring the whole thing down, you don't want to have to reach up on top to try to do that. So you have the bottom one there so you can slide it in and out and lock it down. Or if you're up in your APs or if you're more focusing down on the light, you're reaching down, you don't want to have to reach underneath the light to see what about it's going, what, how to screw this in. It's a little more awkward. So you can choose either on the top lens screw or the bottom. We supply both for you in case you want to use them. Now, I think that's all I wanted to mention about our color. Now our warm white is a little bit more simple. However, it's a lot brighter. It's, so the color is a 250 watt color engine and is a 200, yeah, 250 watt and the, the single static color, the 3200 locked in warm white version is a 260 watt and that delivers around 10,000 lumens of output. And that's a really big difference. It's almost double the amount of output that the color gives. And you may say, well, Jake, why would I want a locked in Kelvin temperature when I can just get the color? The brightness. The brightness is where essentially you want to go. And before we turn this unit on, because there's not much to show on it, why I would choose a warm white option, a dedicated warm white locked in light compared to a color is exactly what I mentioned for the brightness. For me, if I'm doing a front stage wash and I have a very far throw distance, 40, 60, 80, 100 feet, and you need to choose the correct lens tube for that throw distance, but you want your front light to really punch and almost power through anything or to be able to do that. You don't want your front light wash not powerful enough. And that's where the brightness of the warm white takes over is because you can go up and have a system of warm white a, uh, a system of a cool white and a warm white combined together. And, the, and even though that is still subtractive color mixing, if you're using the cool, uh, gel, you're still getting a lot more brightness out of these units than a color option would. So yeah, I would definitely spec the warm white or a dedicated the brighter option for a front light uh, system only because you can easily change that with gel depending on, uh, again, your whatever show you want or what color palettes you really want for the show. Every designer is going to want something different, something a little more cooler, something a little more warmer. You can have all of those the same. But where the color is really awesome, especially if you're doing dance shows, is side lights. Being able to change color through just a command tap on your console is super important. Uh, especially for dance, because in the old school days, if you don't have a col if you don't have a colored ellipsoidal, you would have to go and actually go and throw gel, and that's a technical term what we use in the dance and lighting industry. Was so you would throw gel, and a lot of times you probably wouldn't even because they would be about uh, they'd be your stage sides, so you would just go and throw in the new throw out the old gel and throw in the new gel in between dance performances, and a lot of the times you probably have I don't know 20, 30 seconds in between each dance. And it's quite a task. Now with these color ellipsoidals, you can simply, I mean, the whole rest of your show is being ran off the console. It's just so much easier instead of having two, person, two people on both sides doo -doo 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 -doo, throw in gel really fast, just be able to change them in the cues and be nice, smooth fade-ins and fade-outs all right there, all together. Uh, another good reason why you would want a cool, uh, the color versus over the warm white in a new position would be your high sides. Uh, you could have the punchy warm white and just do a gel option. However, uh, I think being able to change color on your high sides, because uh, usually you'll have a warm and cool white system, again, on your high sides coming down onto your stage for a theater. But instead of that, you can only have one system save on equipment and be able to change color from there. All right, let's turn on the warm white and see how it looks. On this one, I have a 19 degree barrel, so it's going to be a little bigger. Well, it would help if I put my gobo in all the way. There we go. So again, 
left, left shutter in, right shutter in. It's very standard ellipsoidal equipment if you ever worked with an ellipsoidal before. Uh, here's a little tip from the theater. Whenever you're done using a light, you're going to want to home it. So what that means essentially is you're going to want to point it straight down, tuck in all the shutters, and boom, there you go. Uh, another thing I want to mention about ellipsoidals and again theater in general is their pigtails. While these units have uh, plugs right into the back, uh, pow power locking in and out as well as DMX, you generally want to have, uh, for my, for how we're using it today, these are very tight and don't allow me for a lot of uh, movement. However, when you're using these in actual theatrical applications, you're going to want to have a very nice amount of lead on these units. So uh, I'll show you what not to do right now is now when I loosen these up, I can't go any higher than this because I don't have enough slack. So to home it, you would just put it right in there. And when you're going to hang it before you're focusing, make sure you have a nice lot of slack on your cables behind. I'm sure your designer and mass electrician will appreciate it. Um, anything else I want to? Twisting that one the wrong way. There we go. Um, any questions or anything else you guys want to talk about for the Encore Profile Pros? Hey, Caden. So I saw your question. We actually have not compared them to uh, any ETC units. However, I encourage you to check online and download the photometrics. I'm not sure how much I can mention about competitors' products uh, from a manufacturer, so I won't get into it. However, I encourage you to check out the photometrics and check out our photometrics compared to those. Generally, other people's equipment is our color is right in line with other people's color instruments, and our warm white is really nice and punchy and powerful. Um, so they're pretty, pretty standard about, how, uh, about other units. Where I think these units shine is the firmware and the price point, personally. Uh, and that's all I can talk about that aspect of it. What's up, Jose? How's it going? Luis. Hello from Luis from Clean Sound in California. What's going on, Luis? Thanks for joining us. Ellipsoidals. Uh, and if you want more information about ellipsoidals and how they fit into theater, you can go ahead and check out my very long explanation of it on our first video. However, I wanted to take the time to talk about ellipsoidals now. I know I've been talking about them for a while, but they're key and iconic to the theater industry and the most important light you can have in a theater. All right. And our next we're going to be talking about is park hands. And what you may most be used to in a theater environment is a PAR 64. There also are PAR 38s. Personally, I don't really see PAR 38s usage in large theaters anymore unless you have small black boxes. They make good, they make good uh, blue work lights off the side of the stage. Um, there's lots of different other iterations of the PARs, bigger, smaller, but most of the time you're going to be using a PAR 64. Our PARs are not PAR 64s. They're more along the 54 line, but they're a little bit different. So you can't use your standard PAR 64 gel cuts for the gel in these. However, and you also can't use your gel holders from your last units. However, we supply them with you so you don't have to worry about buying them or anything else. They come with the unit. You just have to cut your gel differently. And they're a little smaller, I believe. Um, so we have a 3K and a 5K. Uh, so you may ask, well, why would I want to change the color on a RGBW unit, and again, kind of like how we talked about with the color, I wouldn't, unless you're having a dedicated color for a show. Again, every show is different, every designer is different, so you just have to work with them on that. But, PAR cans, frost. The PAR can is essentially a PAR light in a can, and when I turn it on, you'll see, but it's not necessarily the best soft white, soft light. Um, it tends to be a little harsh, and especially incandescent PAR lamps have a very hot spot center on the unit. Another thing that regular PARs have that these don't is uh, on regular PARs you actually reach in and change the angle of how they throw. Most PARs kind of have like an oval shape so you can actually change the way 
um, they go based off of that. I forget what the actual technical term. It's been too long. But um, Charlotte, do you know? No, I don't. We don't remember us college kids. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, let's put this back in here. So on the back of the unit, and you can check out pictures on adj.com of exactly what I'm talking about. Um, it's just a menu, DMX ins and outs, a, and a plug. So you can't change the orientation of how the lamp goes or anything like that. However, one thing that you can do with these that you can't do in regular PARs is change their beam angle. You may say, well, yeah, I can change the beam angle. You can't. You can change the lamp, which will change the beam angle, but that's it. With these, we actually have an integrated manual focus, or zoom, more like it, and you can actually change, let's see, in this one, I can go all the way down to 7 degrees and then all the way up to 25 degrees. Um, so in a regular PAR, you would have to actually change out the whole lamp um, as they don't have different uh, lenses. Parnells, however, are different, and you can change out the actual lamp. And it really just depends on the billows um, on the lamp itself, depending if you have a narrow spot, wide spot, and all those in between. There's a lot of technology and the old incandescent PARs we're not going to go into. But the new ones are awesome. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, well, they are. But let's get into it. Um, so, like I said, it goes narrow all the way in, and let's turn it on so you can see how it looks. So, let's throw the white chip. Now I am full on. And this gets really distorted on camera. It doesn't do it justice. However, you know what? Actually, let's talk about one thing before we zoom it out. As you can see, there's a nice tight spot right in the middle, and that's the beam angle. And then you have another ring around that, and that's the, I believe it's called the spot, and then around that, that's called the field. See, there's a little bit of a halo, so you, and then you don't, you, when you're looking at this with your own eyes, you don't see it this intensely, but on camera, you do see it. So this is zoomed in all the way, and now we're just going to zoom in all the way out. And that's my hand in there. Hello. This is called flagging a light, for those of you that don't know. And now we are zoomed all the way out. And from here, we can change colors. Let me change my rate so you can see this faster. You can change colors. I can do you know, more of a cool white. I can do more of a 3200 glow. Um, or I can do any other color I like. And I may have already said this. Oh, we got hellos. A part 56. That's what I meant to say. Sorry, Orn. Uh, Leon, I hope I'm saying that right, from Italy. Big hug from Leon. No, no hugs here in America. <laughs> Six feet, please. But hello, Leon. Um, <clears throat> what was I saying? I got distracted. Um, oh, that's right. A color source will never beat a dedicated dedicated white source, which is why we have the other options. So as you can see, this zooms, does color, it's all great. Um, it's very simple. The whole, where Parkans originated from was a very simple concept. It was a Volkswagen light <laughs> par lamp thrown inside of a metal bucket. And there's your stage lighting. Uh, these are a lot more refined and sophisticated. So. You have your color option, and those are great for having, you know, backlights, flagging a light, learning something new every day. There you go, Jose. I'm glad to teach you something new from a pro right there. Um, so you would do, you could use these as backlights. You can use them as work lights if you want. Uh, they're LEDs, so they have a really nice long length period of life, 50,000 hours, if I believe correctly, on this one. But, but most of the time, you're going to be using these as general stage washes, either that are back or side wash. And color is really nice because you can, well, change the color. Because most of the time, when you're using a PAR can, unless you're going for that amber glow of a locked-in 3200, which we'll get into one second here, uh, the colors are really nice because most of the time, you're going to be using a color or a, a gel to change the color. And while uh, and it does, this unit does not be a 1,000 watt incandescent PAR64 lamp. It's very hard to beat that. Uh, this 
This is called the Z120 because it has a 120 watt LED color mixing engine. And I, so I believe with the menu, it is under 150 watts. But you're, so while you are not getting 1,000 watts of output from, your, uh, from this unit, one thing you are getting is additive color mixing compared to subtractive color mixing. So with a regular incandescent PAR, you have the source, which is a locked in warm white, and then you'll throw gel in front of that, and it will block all the light, because white light is made up of all the different colors uh, of light. It will block all of that light, and then only allow that one color to go. Hence, subtractive color mixing. While these are additive, so you do get a lot more punchiness when you're doing satric colors, Another thing you don't have to worry about when you're using, <clears throat> when you're using uh, RGBW color PARs is you don't have to worry about changing gel, kind of on the gel line again. You don't have to worry about burnouts. Most of the time when you're doing PARs, you'll have, after you use it for quite a while, you'll burn out the nice, hot, the, the nice center of it because all incandescent lamps usually have a hot spot. So once that's burnt through, you got to change it out. And what we call those in theater is a consumable good because it gets consumed and throw, thrown out. You know, in fact, now thinking about it, there's a lot of consumable things in theater. Um, so let's stay green, everybody. Recycle. Moving on. That is our RGBW source. Now let's talk about our dedicated 3K. And I didn't bring it with us today, uh, but we also have a dedicated 5K. And like I said before, K stands for, stands for Kelvin. Uh, and that's basically either warm white or cool white on that scale. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Kelvin, I highly encourage you to look it up. And you know, that's actually a great idea for another video, just talking about Kelvin and the qualities of light, uh, like CRI and TM30. We can talk about that in another video. It gives me another idea. Let me know if that's a video you guys would be interested in watching, uh, talking about the qualities of light. Um, so like I said, this is going to be the 3K. We also have a 5K. And if you want to go real rock and roll old school, we also have them in polished chrome. That's right, real groovy. Uh, let's turn on the light and take a look at it. So this looks a little more warm white on camera, and that's just because of how our camera is balanced uh, to better look at all these color sources. Then again, but on this unit, we are zoomed all the way in at 9 degrees. So this, the warm white, I mean the white versions and the color versions do differ in terms of degrees themselves. And I'm just going to slowly go up and they'll click. Obviously you wouldn't do this in a real life show. Uh, all the way up to 30 degrees. And this does look a lot more amber in real life. And again, half of filming for theater or church application is your videographer getting locked in, locking in the colors correctly. Um, but this is a 3200 Kelvin, and you could go ahead and change this to a different color by adding a gel, but I don't really think that's a good usage for this light, considering uh, it's only 100 watts. You still do get a nice output out of this 100 watt engine, but when you start to subtract that to change colors like you would with a regular PAR can or an incandescent lamp, that's when... Um, that's when you lose a lot of brightness. That subtractive color mixing really kills LED fixtures because um, uh, just their lack of brightness, which is why incandescent lamps draw so much power and they are so freaking hot and bright. <laughs> hot, and if you work in the theater industry, you know you probably have some burns from your old incandescent lamps. Uh, these are just a lot more cool running, a lot more energy efficient, and I think personally, how uh, all of the entertainment industry is going. Nobody wants to run a ge power generator on an event for five PAR cans. So that's, what, 5,000 watts compared to how many, let's, you know, quick math, how many 100 watts can you fit into 5,000 watts? That's a lot of lights, regardless. We have a locked in 3200 Kelvin, and these have uh, a really nice CRI as well. They're simple, they're PAR cans. Uh, and I would use these in more of a washing sim, uh, w in a wash function. You can use these as a back wash. However, I think the 3Ks are better for a front light wash if you're not going to go with an ellipsoidal front light. If you have more of a shorter throw distance, uh, more of like a black box or a church situation, 
I would definitely check out these because you can change the zoom range, lock it in, leave it, uh, and it'll be perfect for that stage. Uh, and there you, then you have a front light wash. The one difference between this and the next light I'm going to talk about is how soft it's going to be. And um, well, I'll give you a side-by-side -side comparison of exactly how that looks later. Um, so yes, par, par can. You throw a par in a can. There you go. There's par cans for you. So the next unit we're going to talk about is my Encore FR150Z. So this is 150 watts. Um, dedicated warm white, locked in 3200 Kelvin, just like R3K, um, <clears throat> warm white Fresnel. And Fresnels have a very long history in the entertainment industry. Um, I, uh, I personally don't use Fresnels a lot in theater, but that might just be a West Coast thing. Um, my counterpart, uh, Charlotte, who also has her technical theater degree, we've spoken about that um, several times, and she's actually used Fresnels so many times in her lighting career. So maybe that's just a West Coast middle uh, versus West East Coast kind of thing. Or it just might be what you know standard equipment your theater has. Most of the time when we're talking about theatrical equipment you're not gonna have a budget to go out and be like mm, yes I would love 30 of these Encore Profile Pro Colors. You don't get to do that. Most of the time you get to uh, you know just use whatever the theater has in stock and you have a small either consumable budget, gobo budget, and uh, whatever else budget you may want to do. For instance, UV effect lights or whatever you want to do. <clears throat> um, I think that's my ramble about Fresnels. Let's take a look about what this can do. Um, so it's a locked in 3200 Kelvin. And Candace, can you switch back to me? I'm going to talk about this really quick, the hardware on this. On this unit, you have a nice, easy to use menu on the side with a USB update port. So if we come out with any updated firmware, and a lot of times we do. Uh, if you get a unit that's, a, that's you know, right off the, fresh off the press, either a first or second run, third, fourth, whatever, and you had the unit for a substantial amount of time, please reach out to us because more than likely there's going to be a software update for your light and it may immensely change the functionality of how it works. Um, some of these updates we do, depending on what fixture, include dimming, include sometimes like in our Visi Wash C37, Z19. We recently updated those, I think a year, maybe, yeah, more like a year since we put them out and we just put a dynamic white scale in them. So again, Check, uh, check online and see if you have any updates for your fixtures. So that's USB update port is very useful for the average consumer and theatrical master electrician because it's probably going to be your ME going to be updating these. So thank your ME. Remember, thank your ME. <laughs> they do a lot of work and you don't notice it. Um, in the back here, we got power locking in and out. So we have three and five pin DMX ins and outs. And again, make sure you leave enough length to focus your light. Uh, you never want to be that guy that says, all right, let's focus it, and then have to go, oh, hold on, I have to get a three-foot extender because I didn't run it correctly. Um, on the back here, we also have a safety cable. Uh, I don't even know what you would call it, connection loop, something like that. It's basically where you put your safety cable. I have mine locked up here just so... Um, because I just didn't, have, I just wanted to do it that way. These aren't really at dangerous working heights, but always safety cable your lights. I'm sure every theatrical employee has a horror story of where a light fell. Ask them. It's not cool. Safety cable your lights. Um, and then also back here we have a manual zoom knob. Um, and up front, let's take this off so you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, I see another thing I'll mention, you probably can't see it, but I'm, this thing can't go anywhere because I actually have a safety onto this barn door. That's another thing people forget to, to do is also safety your uh, accessory equipment because this falling from 45 feet can still really hurt somebody. So make sure you are being safe. And right here, uh, so we have a gel, uh, gel holder. If you want to change the color of the gel or change it to a different Kelvin temperature, Ideally, that's how I would use Fresnels is um, a dedicated front light wash or back wash, any types of wash you want to use. And I wouldn't necessarily change the color on them. 
I will definitely change the Kelvin temperature. So there's lots of different filters you can buy to change this locked in 3200 to more of a daylight 4500 Kelvin or a cool white options. So while this is not a color and you can't change it, change the Kelvin temperature like the, like the Encore Profile Pro color, you can change it with a gel. So just like our ellipsoidals, we have the back slot, which is for your gel. And then right on front of that, you can slide in your barn door. There we go. And then it comes down and locks that into place. So they look that right. There we go. Perfect. So now uh, with these are called your barn doors. And um, well, I guess they're called barn doors because they operate like barn doors. Left closes and then the right closes. Um, this is a very easy, simple to use barn doors. More sophisticated barn doors will actually have little inserts out here on the side that you can prong up and really block all the light. But essentially, what this is for is to shape your light. Um, so if you have a wide zoom and you, if you have a wide throw and you just want to cut off a little bit of the right, go ahead and take that right in and it will boom there you go now now it's not shining on anything um, and this does rotate so if you need to change the angles or anything you can cool now I think I'm ready to show them what this looks like so this is the FR 150 Z so right now I am zoomed in and again this doesn't do it justice on camera because and again that's just camera settings but this is a super, uh, what's the correct term here? A super frosted or um, su a super well, frosted light. It's a lot more soft. There is the technical term. It is a soft light as opposed to a parkan where it is a very harsh light. So this, I'm going to zoom it out and you'll probably be able to see a little bit more here is it becomes softer and softer and wider zoom obviously so it has a very nice zoom range I'm essentially covering this entire white curtain here and this is about a 20 feet wide by 13 foot 13 foot wide curtain and I'm only about I don't know maybe 20 feet away from it so from here I can do my left shutter cut my, my, my left barn door my right barn door and then boom there we go now I have focused my light. Throw that out again, and there you go. So now I can do the same thing, zoom this in. So for nails, where would I put these? Well, I would use these, like I said before, as a front or backlight wash. And uh, mostly for, well, for studio applications, it ranges barely. Uh, it ranges a lot, but um, more for theatrical and church applications, I would use these as a front light, change the color temperature like I said. Um, let me throw on the PAR just to show you the difference. Let me zoom this in. So this is zoomed in all the way on a Fresnel versus on a PAR can. So obviously their beam, uh, their beam degrees are slightly different. But you can see this is a very hard, you can't see that, but this is a very hard edge. See how you can see the circle? And a normal incandescent 64 won't look like this, but you'll still get a similar effect uh, of it being harsh, not sharp. And the Fresnel here is a very soft light. And if I was to light someone with this, everything would look very soft and nice and even. That's essentially what a Fresnel does. It distributes and washes very soft light, which is why they use them in the film industry so much to simulate the sun. Uh, because the sun is soft. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think that covers our Fresnel. And the one last thing I want to talk about the Fresnel is that it is a locked in 3200K source and it has a high CRI. So you are essentially getting a high quality of white light. And that kind of covers all your basic static lights that you will find in a theater. There's lots of other things that you can find 
in a theater and um, like hazers, um, lots of other equipment, power distro, but there's so much you can get into. But one last thing I wanted to cover, and you guys haven't actually seen this, is our, our FS3000 LED. And this is something that myself, myself, uh, sorry, I was looking at the comments, uh, that myself and some other members of ADJ have actually worked really hard for to try to get this a very good entry level follow spot for small to mid sized theaters, churches, or events. And before we move on, I noticed there's a couple comments. I'm going to go look at them since I've been away for a little bit. All right, so I think this is a pretty cool comment, just to the history of Parkans from Day David Atten. And uh, hello, Mr. Day Day J. David. Uh, <laughs> I've actually talked to you before online, so it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, and he said, for your education, you are right. The Parkan started with the sealed beam of Volkswagen or some other cars. The first Parkans were made using a three-pound coffee can, which were steel, and a 12-volt transformer. Kind of cool theatrical history right there. And why didn't you do a side-by-side -side comparison to the intensity or the color versus the white Lico? And let's do that before we move on to the ellipsoidal. You're absolutely right. Let's do that. <clears throat> Let me separate these a little bit. And I have, again, they're different degree angles, just so we can represent all of them here. <clears throat> Let me grab my color and put it in a 3200 look. That's pretty locked in. And my warm white on top of that. So if I put them right next to each other, and this is kind of how you can tell what will come through, and our camera is at a, a little bit different of an angle. The warm, the, the warm white option, flagging this one, just absolutely decimates right there where, where these kind of uh, intersect in my little Venn diagram here. So the locked in, the warm white is almost twice as bright as the color option. David, I hope that answered your question. All right, now our ellipsoidal. I'm sorry, ellipsoidal, <laughs> our follow spot. So like I said, this is something we've worked really hard to do this right. Let me get this a little more in the shot here. To do this right, and we really wanted to make an easy to use, cost effective uh, uh, follow spot, because one, we didn't really have anything that fit more modern technology. We had some older ones, an incandescent and an LED one that were usable, but a little underpowered. Um, their colors didn't look as right. We just needed something that was current spec with the current technology. And that's what we've come out with the FS3000 LED. Uh, personally, oh, sorry if that made a noise. I am a lefty. Um, and I have never encountered a left-handed follow spot before. People just don't make them. Well, as you can see here, we have a handle on the right and on the left. For those of you, you know, sometimes you may be operating it in a weird orientation or something, and you need to use the left. If you're not left-handed, you have both options available to you. I thought that was important to represent the lefties out there. And uh, spinning it around to the back, you won't be able to see this very well, but we have a nice color menu here. I will unlock it for us. Right now I have the manual mode on. Um, we have three and five pin DMX ins and outs, so you can hook these up to your lighting console and control them through there. So you have exactly timed color, uh, exactly timed fades with your scene, so you don't have to worry about the operator uh, missing a cue or, you know, whatever you want, or, or uh, you know, not blacking out soon enough, blacking out too soon. Being a follow spot operator is a lot of work, and there's a lot of knowledge that goes into it. So um, we tried to take, we tried to give you the option to run it manually for those skilled enough to run a follow spot, or for those people that just want, you know, a volunteer to point and shoot. Look, spot, spotlight your daughter for this church dance. There you go. You don't have to worry about them messing it up. Just follow them. <laughs> so we have our integrated menu here. There's a manual dimming knob, a power in and outs, an IR button. So if you want to control it via remote control, 
if you would want to do that, you can. And again, a software USB software update port. On the top here, this is there's a little there's some brushes in here. Um, this you can't see this either, but um, and you don't have to zoom in or anything. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is where you could put gobos. You can do so many different things with the gobo in a follow spot. You can do breakup textures if you really want to. You could um, do a, a glass gobo in these if you wanted to. You can do like a movement effect. Uh, I don't know, like for instance, like uh, if you're doing fiddler on the roof, you could do like a half moon and have it go up and over to simulate a nighttime effect. That's just something that just came off the top of my head right now. See if there's any comments. We're good. Um, and then moving forward up the lights, we have a manual iris. And this does go in nice and tight. It doesn't fully close because you really don't need it to fully close because you have dimming control as opposed to older follow spots that were incandescent or more likely arc lamps. They never shut off. Arc lamps never shut off. And even when they do shut off, you have to wait 15 minutes or more to turn them back on, and that's because of how much heat is inside them, and you don't want them to explode. And generally, those can run anywhere around $150 and more just for that lamp. I've popped a lamp before. By being dumb, don't do it. Your mass electrician will be very mad at you. Um, <clears throat> so you don't really need a full closing iris on this unit just because uh, you can have the man. You can either you can manually dim it, and then moving forward, you have your focus and zoom range here. There's two different uh, lenses that will move in and out to calibrate and make larger or smaller spots. Last piece of hardware on this is right here. And it does all catch. And what these are is what the industry standard term is called a boomerang. Boomerang. Um, and essentially what this is is a gel changer. So uh, if you're doing um, Willy Wonka and all of a sudden, oh no, Violet, you're turning Violet. Boom, Violet. <laughs> um, or a lot of other times what you'll be doing here is throwing in different filters to change the color temperature of a light. Uh, for instance, spotting different color tones, like spotting um, um, uh, Latinx people versus white people versus African American people completely different the way how you light them and the different Kelvin temperatures that you need. So that's where you would uh, go ahead and throw in a different Kelvin temperature change filter, gel, whatever you want to call it, or color filters. Or you can even throw in a frost. So if you want a nice frosted edge around your spot, again, kind of like how we covered the ellipsoidals, doing it manually might work for most designers, but some designers are picky about how they want, how frosted they want their looks to be, and they'll ask you to throw an LSF filter in this. And it's a very simple operation. You can put one down and you'll say the next scene's coming up, push the next one down, and that will trigger the first one to collapse. Or you can do double at the same time. If you want to release one, there's a little release knob up here. So you can do two at the same time, and then do the other two and then they fall down and now they're all gone. This comes with the unit. Uh, there's little four little thumb screws up front here that you can actually take this on and off. So if you don't want to use it, you don't want it in your way, don't worry about it. You can take that off super easily and not even use it, but it's there as an option. One, two last things I want to talk about this before we actually turn it on or anything else. I'm going to get it a little better in the angle here so you can see this. Um, and we're not going to go into too detail about this, but we, and we, because we're going to make a nice announcement and I'll probably do a video about it, is we're actually coming out with a brand new stand and a follow spot adapter for that stand. I don't remember exactly what the stand is going to be called, but the adapter here is called our uh, Pan Glide. Essentially, what it is, it's just ball bearings inside this um, M10 receiver that go into this ad adapter here. It has ball bearings inside that as well. And I'm going to disconnect the power. And I don't encourage you to do this at home, but just to simulate very smooth and easy operation of the light. So it just pans and glides around here. 
and my bolt, my M10 bolt that's keeping this onto this stand is not moving at all. So that's what's really important. You know, you can put a regular uh, receiver, or regular clamp on this, and you spin this enough, and it's going to fall. But the way we've made this and engineered this is that this is totally safe to use uh, and to move, and it's super smooth, nothing is rubbing against each other, very easy. <clears throat> so please stay tuned for our sta upgraded stands and our follow spot adapter, which are sold separately, individually, um, to, soon. And I, one last note about the stand. This stand is super heavy duty and it works really well. So even if you don't have a follow spot but you need a stand, uh, the stand is very heavy duty and will hold a lot of weight if you want to use it, which is why they're sold individually. So you can buy this separately even if, you're not, even if you don't want to use the follow spot or you don't have a follow spot. All right, I think I've talked enough. Let's look at it. So, like I said before, I could turn this on with my console. However, I'm just going to do this manually because um, I really like the manual mode, this manual control mode on the back. Um, so I'm going, you can either press the on or off buttons instead of fade time, or you can use this manual dimmer knob. So, this is, this is the follow spot with the IRS in. I'll take it out. And now I can zoom it out. And you can use this as a soft edge and just focus in on the iris, but I'm just going to focus in right now onto the actual curtain with the beam. There we go. So as you can see, there is a nice zoom range. This is its narrowest, and this is the widest it can go. And obviously, you can focus for different and throw distances. That's essentially what we wanted to make with this light. To be able to spot someone 20 feet away, their whole body, or if they're 40, 60, I think 80 feet is a little pushing it, but you can definitely achieve it. Spotting them, their whole body, or just the head. And then if, even if they're super close and you, this is, this is too big. Here, I'll step in front of the light. I'm going to be blinded just to show you. This is, even if you want, let's say you're this far away and you still want it even tighter on me, this is when that manual iris comes into play and is very effective. You can just go ahead and scroll that on, right, and in. And I can make that nice and sharp too. So now, I'm probably going to have to orient, <laughs> find this, <clears throat> but now, as you can see, it's only hitting my face. And a lot of times when you're operating a follow spot, they're going to ask you to do either shoulder up shots, just head shots, or full body shots. So like I said, being a follow spot op operator is quite a lot of work. <laughs> so you have uh, dimming modes in this unit as well. So. Uh, you can manually, you can set nice smooth dims. Sorry this isn't that focused, but that's fine. Um, I'm just going to turn it on and off really fast. See how it's nice and smooth? Even just quick fade outs. So the reason why we threw dimming modes in this, so if you want a nice smooth dim on it, you can. Or if you want to change the dimming mode really fast to have a nice sharp cutout, just to go on, off really fast, you can turn off the dimming modes via DMX or through the menu on the unit. And there you go, you have sharp in and outs. So right now I have it set to nice and smooth because I just wanted to show you guys how smooth that operates. Um, I forgot to mention on the back here, there's actually two side handles. And that is for rear operation. Oops, sorry if that was loud. Rear operation of the fall spot. So I'll loosen my tilt knob here. And now I'll turn it on so you can see what I'm doing. And now it's nice and smooth. Um, so you can run it from the rear. Yep, we can do it from the rear. You can do it the left side, lefties, there you go. First ever. <laughs> Thinking about you guys, don't worry. And then right orientated, which is probably how most people are going to operate this follow spot. Ballyhoo! Um, <clears throat> locking this back tight again. I see we have a question. Uh, David, the, it does not have a dowser or a guillotine. Um, 
what we did instead of that to limit all of the things you want to, you may need in the optical path is the gobo. So if you wanted to change um, basically how the length of the follow spot, not the length, the the shape of it, that's where you would pop in a gobo. So it doesn't have a dowser or anything like that. We just wanted to make a very entry level follow spot for small to medium applications. <clears throat> um, and that's essentially where the dimming would come into control. So most of the time you're not going to be running this. The way I see it in theatrical environments, you would hook this up to the lighting console and have this completely timed with the console. Um, but we also included manual options to run uh, through that as well. Yes, Jose, it is a lot of fun. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, can the boomerang be moved to the left side? Um, I actually don't think it can. The way it's orientated, it has to be on this side. But I will show you how to take it off right now. Whoops, don't blind you. So I'm actually not even going to take these thumb screws all the way off. It just comes up and over. Yeah, it's only on the right. So you can only put it on the right side for your right operated. man. The world is so rightist. <laughs> Just kidding. So this is how it looks without that boomerang on top. Nice here. You can take these thumb screws off if you don't want it. Boom. There you go. Um, so we're just going to take a second. If you guys have any extra questions or anything else you want me to go over, please ask right now. Uh, David, thank you for those great questions. You're on the ball today. <clears throat> so we're just going to wait a minute and see if any of those questions filter in. Well, I'm just going to ramble on, um, kind of do my speech here. Um, but in general, thanks for coming and watching us and watching me talk. I know, uh, I'm sure you guys had a lot of fun, just like I did. But um, you know, I really enjoy doing these and uh, being able to talk to our audiences and being able to reach out to you guys during these hard times. You know, it's um. It's kind of crazy what the world and the entertainment industry is going through. What's up, Jake? We have someone famous in the chat, Mr. Jake Robert. Thank you for joining us, Jake. Howdy doody. <laughs> but yeah, like I was saying, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy times that we're going through. But, you know, we are a very powerful industry. And the work that we have done through PLSN and NAM trying to get our representatives in Congress uh, to, you know, keep us alive really up until when we're safe to work again is super important so if you have the time please reach out to your local representative and uh, tell them that we need help our industry our industry it needs help right now uh, we really do especially all of our gig workers I have so many friends right now that want to work and are so passionate about who what they do and you know they just get to sit at home right now so please Take the time, email, and uh, you know, please be an advocate for our industry. I guess that's all I have to say. So I don't see any more um, questions coming in. So let's wrap it up right now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I'll see you guys on Thursday for our next video, which we're recovering the focus spot. 4Z, 5Z, and 6Z. And one last thing I forgot to mention too, we're also going to have uh, a, a features videos where I take an in-depth look of our ellipsoidals and our follow spot coming out very soon. So if you're interested in any of those, and I, I know I talked about a lot of talking points today, but we really get up and close and take a look at the unit. And yes, Jake, they are. Too bad you missed it. <laughs> take a scroll back and look over what we talked about because we talked about a lot of cool stuff. But yeah, take, t uh, keep, a, keep an eye out for our videos coming out. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Thanks again.